Hello, I'm Adam Schatz, and you're listening to the first episode of a new edition of our Close Reading series, focused on revolutionary thought in the 20th century. Our guest over the next four episodes is the distinguished philosopher Judith Butler, a professor at the University of California at Berkeley, whose work has exerted enormous influence on the study of gender and sexuality, and on how we think about the precariousness of contemporary life, grief and mourning, and the shaping of the modern self. The book we're discussing in this episode is Anti-Semite and Jew by Jean-Paul Sartre. Anti-Semite and Jew was first published in French in 1946, just after the war, under the title Reflections on the Jewish Question. A slender book, just over 160 pages long, Anti-Semite and Jew, caused a great stir in France for directly confronting the question of anti-Jewish bigotry, something that the French had swept under the rug after the liberation from Nazism. The Vichy government had deported more than 75,000 Jews during the war, 11,000 of them children. But after the war, there was very little discussion of these crimes or of France's responsibility. The de Gaulle government cultivated the myth that Vichy was not France and that the French had been unified in their resistance to the occupation, aside from a handful of collaborators. Jews were discouraged from talking about the fact that they had been specifically targeted. Sartre, who was not Jewish, broke the silence. Now all France rejoices and fraternizes in the streets, he wrote. Social conflict seems temporarily forgotten. The newspapers devote whole columns to stories of prisoners of war and deportees. Do we say anything about the Jews? Do we give a thought to those who died in the gas chambers at Lublin? Not a word, not a line in the newspapers. Anti-Semitism, he declared, is not a Jewish problem. It is our problem. And not one Frenchman will be secure so long as a single Jew in France or in the world at large can fear for his life. Sartre's candor and solidarity were bracing, and many Jewish readers found consolation, even liberation, in anti-Semite and Jew. Claude Lanzmann, who would later work with Sartre at the journal Les Temps Modernes, said that after reading the book, he walked the streets differently and felt that he could breathe again. Anti-Semite and Jew would go on to have a tremendous influence on other studies of prejudice, bigotry, and stigma. Franz Fanon, in Black Skin, White Masks, described Sartre's evocation of anti-Semitism as among the most beautiful pages he'd ever read. But the book has since provoked considerable contention. While some scholars have praised the book for defending what the historian Maurice Samuels calls a right to difference, Others have accused Sartre of ignorance, even of anti-Semitism itself, for arguing that Jewish identity is founded on little more than the shared experience of anti-Semitic persecution. To some, the book is a precocious critique of French universalism, to others, an expression of it. Judith, I thought we might begin by talking about the man who wrote this book, Jean-Paul Sartre, a philosopher, novelist, and playwright, who launched the existential movement. Can you tell us what Sartre had achieved up to that point, why he'd become France's most influential philosopher, and why it mattered so much that he addressed this topic? Mm. Well, I think it's it's true that Sartre was uh, at the center of French existentialism, but I think if we consider the history of existentialism, we might have to go back to Kierkegaard or Nietzsche, Sartre was reading the work of Edmund Husserl, a phenomenologist in the 1930s, and he he saw great promise in that theory, in that philosophy, but he was also frustrated with its abstractions. And he said that a, a philosophy that was not able to conduct a good description of what happens in a cafe or even... Um, a glass of wine or a cup of tea is not worth reading. So his idea was to make phenomenology concrete, to revise it in certain ways. He wrote on the imagination, he wrote on the emotions, uh, and he wrote his great tome, Being in Nothingness, in the late 30s, early 40s. And that became, of course, the uh, first, what some would call, systematic approach to existential philosophy. He also, of course, was a a writer uh, and wrote several books that have become quite renowned, including Nausea and No Exit, a play. Uh, So he 
He wrote essays, he wrote literature, he wrote plays, he wrote philosophy, and he became increasingly a public figure. I think when he started writing Anti-Semite and Jew, Reflexions sur la question juive, he was publishing in Les Temps Modernes, and some parts of this were published in the autumn of 1944. So right as the war was ending and there was a question of how France might take stock of its own participation in anti-Semitism, its own alliance with Nazi powers. And as you said, a question, is Vichy France or is France, in fact, guilty of a longstanding anti-Semitism that made Vichy possible? And Sartre came out on, on the latter side of that debate, uh, claiming that anti-Semitism was, in fact, fairly deep-seated in France. And he went on in this book to offer some quite vivid portraits of the anti-Semite, the French anti-Semite in particular, trying again to develop a philosophical understanding of what kind of hatred this is, how do we account for this kind of hatred, but also giving us a concrete, if not popular, sense of what the anti-Semite is like, what kind of personality is this, and what is it seeking to accomplish in life? You know, I have to admit to you that I was uh, somewhat surprised that you'd chosen this as the first book, and and the reason is that um, while anti-Semite and Jew deals with the relationship between self and other, which is a theme that arguably runs through some of your work, you're more associated with post-structural thinkers like Foucault and Derrida, who are often quite scathing about Sartre's existential humanism. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when did you first read this book and what kind of impression did it make? Oh, well, you know, when I studied philosophy in the late 70s and early 80s, I studied two traditions. One of them was a phenomenology, meaning Husserl, Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, and the other one was Hegel and Marx. And when I studied in Germany, I, I studied hermeneutics and critical theory. So post-structuralism came to me later and only in part but I've never accepted the kind of repudiation of uh, existential phenomenology that some post-structuralists insist upon. In fact, it's quite funny in France, you know, intellectual trends are suddenly very live, and then you never speak about that person again, right? And you don't cite them, you don't even, you pretend like they don't exist. So there was a time when, you know, obviously everybody was reading Sartre in the 40s and 50s. People were seriously reading and debating Sartre. It doesn't mean they accepted everything he said. But if he spoke, you listened and you fought or you you discussed. Um and then suddenly, oh no, that's passé, and we don't talk about him anymore, and oh, 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 why read that? And um, so I've, ne I've never really liked that. That strikes me as a, um, almost a fashion-driven approach to intellectual life. <laughs> and the last years, I've, I've actually gone back to discredited texts to see what they can still tell us, because I am skeptical of um, a certain kind of anxious presentism in contemporary theoretical discourse. That would be a great title, in fact, on discredited texts. Yes. <laughs> when did you first read Anti-Semite and Jew? Was it in graduate school or was it before? I think it was actually as an undergraduate. And I'll tell you frankly, I, I still have some of the same feelings about it I had then. I think Sartre is brilliant. I wish I had written some of those sentences. At the same time, he makes me really angry and I'm infuriated not so much about what he says about the anti-Semite, but what he says about the Jewish people. I don't believe he did his homework. He didn't study the history of Judaism. He didn't think about the generations from Eastern Europe, the Ashkenazi Jews who had come to France. He certainly wasn't in 1946 in a position to think carefully about Algerian Jews, although he did become more aware of that and the Sephardi tradition more broadly later in life. So, you know, I think he over uh, determines the power of the anti Semite or Christian society more broadly to determine the identity of the Jew. And my, my main complaint with this text, um, you know, and 
It was a complaint with which I started when I read it, uh, probably in the late 70s and early 80s, um, was that there's too strong a sense that there would be no Jew if there weren't the anti-Semite. The anti-Semite creates the Jew. And it's, it's a very shocking thesis, right? It's a like, terribly shocking and disorienting thesis. Um, and maybe there's some truth to be discerned from that, but um, in general, I feel like um, he discounts the history of Judaism and the history of the Jewish people, the history of immigration, and the, the positive, by which I mean substantial historical dimensions of Jewish life that he takes to be relatively unimportant in relation to the power of anti-Semitism. Thanks for listening to this extract from Human Conditions, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episode and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.